Okay, so when we have a beehive or beehives as we are shown right here, there's a lot of things that come into play. Is there a perfect uh, place for a hive? Probably not, unless it's right out in the middle of a field. Um, but we're gonna step through this step by step and make sure that that we're communicating where the, the best place is uh, for a hive. Let's start with the sun here. Um, let me get my telestrator working here, okay. So we've got the sun right here. He's happy or not mm -hmm. so happy, I guess, right there. The sun is very, very important, folks. Um, bees need as much sun as possible. Um, so when we look at sun, how much sun is hitting the hive, uh, we want to see during the spring and summer months somewhere between 10 and 12 hours of daylight directly on the bees. Now, you may be saying, Ray, I want to offer shade to, to my bees. Well, that's not the way our bees are, are made. Our bees are made to get as much sun as possible. And if they get too warm on the inside, then they'll come around the outside of the hive and congregate out there where it's cooler and allowing less bees on the inside so it will cool down in there also. Now the sun also um, plays an important part of keeping the soil, uh, let me go back to this again, the soil right here in front of the hives is very, very important. Um, we want to see as beekeepers this area really dry. And the reason being is, is first of all, we as beekeepers will be behind the hives and we want to have good firm footing when it comes to uh, us managing the hives. We don't want to be slipping around in mud or wet grass. Uh, so having a good dry uh, on top of a hill, as you see right here, this is the hill, um, is always very, very good. The other thing that the sun does to the soil here, it keeps it dry so that um, when we have uh, small hive beetles that come out and go into the ground to pupate, the, the pupate will go into dry ground and will die. And most of the time will dry, especially if you use diatomaceous earth uh, to treat in front of the hives. And Clemson University at one point did a, a really good study on how far uh, the, uh, not the varroa, but the um, small hive beetle pupa will get on the ground and how far will they crawl. And this is a 14 foot is the maximum that they'll crawl. And one of the things that I like to do is put landscaping fabric uh, under, under rock in front of it so that one, they can't burrow down into the ground and the heat from the, the architectural uh, fabric will burn them up. So that's why I like to see dry ground and also the, the, the dryness and full sun will help you uh, as a beekeeper on that side. Now, um, let's take a look at this tree right here. Um, I'm taking it that this is in a northeastern uh, position. The thing that you do not want to do is put hives underneath the, the tree branches uh, that are there. Because one, the, if we look at that, the tree has shade. And that shade will keep a moist ground uh, there. So um, again, you're playing with the small hive beetle pupa to make sure that it they don't have a moist so soil to go into. Now, a northeast or true north tree, where the tr where the the hives are out far enough from the branches themselves, is ideal. Now, obviously, in here, I'm not going to put them into the water source. That's yet to be spoken about, but that's what we want to make sure as beekeepers what we're doing on that, that there. Now, this does not mean that you can't have bees if you have to put them in to, to a forest area. 
the the issue that you will have is one again the soil will be damp and you'll need to put in uh, small hive beetle traps within your hive to be able to keep the small hive beetles from taking over on the hive there. Nikki, do you have any questions that have come in? That was actually going to be my question. There was one on there. What what were the disadvantages and how could you overcome the hive beetle issue if you were sitting in a shade? Because I know we had a young lady actually mm -hmm. come in the other day and that was mm -hmm. her problem, just where her hive was going to be. There are trees mm -hmm. around. So that was one of the things that we discussed was the hive beetles. So you're saying the yes. traps is the best yeah. option for that? Yeah, and you, you want to use the, the, the beetle gel uh, on that there, which uses a bait of apple cider vinegar. And I'll just draw a quick diagram here of it. And it just clips on to the, to the, the frame itself. But in the center here, you're going to have where your bait is, and that's apple cider vinegar. And then over here on this side, you're going to fill it up on each side with mineral oil. And so the mineral oil is where they come in and they fall into this thinking that it's the apple cider vinegar. Okay. So it's a, it's a great bait, but this is something, folks, that you're going to have to change out once a week. So when you're doing your weekly hive inspections during the spring and summer, this has got to be one of the staples. And I, I would recommend, Nikki, that there will be two on each hive on the back side of the hive okay. where the beekeeper stands. It would be mm -hmm. the closest to them as possible. Okay. Because the small hive beetle does not like the direct sunlight, and that's part of the reason why they get chased to the back side of the hive on that. Interesting. Okay, good to know. All right, so we're out from underneath the tree, but that tree can also help us along with what you see here, a, a hedge, an evergreen hedge. Um, that evergreen is very, very important because during the winter months, you have a strong prevailing northern wind, and that can definitely chill your hives. Uh, even here in the south, we have some 10 and 20 degree days, and Sometimes those days go into several days. And when they go into several days, that's when you can lose your hive on that. So you can either create a barrier um, here in this area behind your hives, or you can have an evergreen hedge. And you would want that at probably about five feet high so that would deflect the winds properly. And you may have to do additional bracing depending on your elevation and how strong the winds are on that side. All right, so let me clear this up just a little bit so we can keep drawing all over this. Um, the, all right, so now we've talked about the evergreen hedge. We've talked about the prevailing winds. And now we've talked about the uh, having trees or or having them in a forest. Now, having them in a forest is, is something that we do see, especially those that are located in mountainous areas. They don't have a whole lot of direct sun. But again, if you put them in there, you got to be really on guard and be on the offensive and not on the defensive, especially as it pertains to small high beetles. Now, the other thing that you want to do is you want to have these hives pointing in a south southeast uh, position. So if you want to get out your smartphone and go into one of the apps there and just open up your compass, that will help you position to the southeast. Now, southeast is there because it is um, the best optimization of sunlight. It will wake your bees up early. Um, I see at times my, my bees are, are flying at 545 during the summer uh, and late spring to begin collecting nectar and pollen. So southeast is the best. Now, if you have these pointing in a true south, then you're going to get a little less sunlight coming directly into the hive and they're going to be flying out a little later in the morning on that. Now, there are some people that have such a mountainous area that they won't see the, the sunshine till 10, 11 o'clock 
in the morning, you still want to point them in a southeasterly direction. All right. Any other questions you got there, Nikki? Well, I just had a quick question. So you're saying even if the sun doesn't hit until 10 or so, you still want that southeastern. Yes. So what would be the reason for that? Explain that. It's the maximum. Uh, you got to get your bees woke up. Okay. You know, it's kind of like uh, us as human beings is, is that we naturally wake up when the sunlight's coming in mm -hmm. in the morning and we're up and ready to go. The same thing with bees. Now, um, we're playing with a lot of issues here. One is the life expectancy of a spring and summer bee is 45 days. And we want to get the maximum effort out of those bees because the bees don't sleep. You know, they when they're in their hive at night, folks, they're, they're, they're making propolis uh, to patch up any holes within the hive. They're also um, making wax from their wax glands to, to do more combing within the hive. So these bees get no days off, um, no days off. And um, so what we're trying to do is just optimize, Nikki, every hour that those 45-day bees are there because after 45 days, uh, they're deceased at that point. Okay. All right. So... We got a sturdy hive stand um, that is important to have. Uh, there is getting them off the ground, folks. Uh, you know, depending on your height, it, it can be anywhere from, from eight inches to a foot and a half uh, for, for taller folks. Now, one thing that you do want to be very careful on is how many supers you're going to go up. And... Typically, I would say no more than four supers up, depending on your height, of course. But you'll want to go on ahead and harvest that honey as soon as it's capped. And just keep it rolling. But don't get where you're getting up into the eight, eight high supers because that's how you get yourself hurt with an 80 pounds or 100 pounds of, of super full of honey on that side. Nikki, have you ever gotten that high? No. <laughs> yeah. No, but I've seen it. And I have a hard enough time mm -hmm. even with just three because yeah. I'm kind of short. So to yeah. reach is, it's high. So I couldn't yeah. imagine those that do seven and eight. <laughs> so we want to be safe, folks. That's the big thing with um, stacking our supers up. And it, it, it just takes us a few minutes to go out uh, once a week, check on them and add a super, take a super um, and have enough supers on hand so that you're ready to add a super. You don't want to lose any nectar collection uh, because you're having to put together a, a super and frames and put foundation in. All right, so we've got that. Um, is there, real quick, is there a, a specific type of stand that you feel is more durable or that's better to use for your hives? Well, it, it really comes down to Nikki preference. If you've got time on your hands, you can make a, a two by six um, hive stand and put it out in your yard and and concrete it down and and it's there to stay for the for the next hundred years uh, on that. Um, but then we have the metal hive stands. That's a quick. You can set them up and put your hive in it, and you're done within. 15 minutes at the very max. And that's if you have to look for tools to put it together. On that okay. there. Um, I personally um, don't, don't go with the, the singles because I have, you know, anywhere from six to 12 um, hives in my backyard. And that just doesn't work for mm -hmm. us on single stands on that there. Hey, Ray, this would be a good time to ask this question that I've seen uh, come in about yep. the difference between the eight frame and the 10 frame. How do you make a determination about whether or not one is preferential over the other? Well, Nikki and I have had a lot of talks mm -hmm. over eight frame and 10 frame. And Nikki, tell us a little bit about why the eight frame is, is, is a good bargain for folks. Well, and it really is. And this kind of goes back to to even my size and, and being a female. Mm -hmm. um, I have a 10 frame. Like I said, sometimes mm -hmm. it's a little more difficult for mm -hmm. me. They get really heavy. And, you know, at any given time, you could have 50, 70 pounds of, of honey and comb and nectar going on in, inside of your super. Yes. So it needs to be something that's manageable. So 
Um, the eight frame is good for that. You lose a little bit of that weight. I can easily go in and pick it up and move it and do what I need to do without, you know, destroying everything or dropping. So you don't have to go to Planet Fitness <laughs> to, yeah. do, to take off a super. Not right? this year. Right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Good. All right. So now, Nikki, have you taken single frames out and put put those into a reserve super and put a fresh frame in in place of it? Have so you done that? I have not done that. I have okay. not done just a single frame. So maybe Because sometimes mm -hmm. those frames, you'll have only two or three that are capped, mm -hmm. and the rest are in the midst of, right. of being not capped, right and you can't, you can't process those mm -hmm. yet. So right. um, one of the tricks that folks do is just start pulling frames. Mm -hmm. uh, here in the South, you can start pulling frames as early as the first week of May. Mm -hmm. And up North, you're going to be looking at it probably the – the middle of June before you're ready to start pulling any kind of frames out. So yeah. that is another option that that's there, Brian, um, just to answer, answer your question there. All right. So let's go to the next um, part of this slide here is water. Water is so important, folks. You don't have to have it, you know, within 15 feet uh, like this picture has. But I would say that you should have it within a thousand feet of of the hive. Now, that does not have to be a running stream. You can also use like a a bird feeder um, that that you can buy almost anywhere. And what I would do is I'd just put rocks in it and then fill it up with fresh water. And the bees will come. They'll land on those rocks. Those rocks are there to allow them not to um, drown in, in the water there. So that's the reason why you want to put rocks in there that break the water line so that they can stand on it and drink um, at will. Now, that can be also a pond. It can be a river. It can be a little stream. Uh, but your bees need water year-round. How uh, about my neighbor's swimming pool? Now, Brian, that is not a good thing. That's not being neighborly, <laughs> is it? Well, whether it's chlorinated pool or saltwater pool, the bees are going to get attracted to it. And so um, what, I would, what I would say is, is if you can see your neighbor's pool, you got to have some real discussion with your neighbor and say, hey, I've got bees, and they're going to be attracted to your, your pool. Could I put a, um, could you call me the night before and let me know if you're going to have a pool day at your house? And if, if you do, then I'll put a, a mesh hive cover over it to contain the bees while you're enjoying your pool. Now, obviously, if they're going to be using their pool every day, then it's not a good time to do beekeeping because they're going to get frustrated. You're going to get frustrated and that that won't be good for the hobby there because um, we want everybody to enjoy. So that could time. be a good, important conversation yes. even before you get into the hobby yes. is, is making sure they're okay yes. and understand that uh, there could be some bees that show up in the pool and that if, if they don't have uh, your your brand on them, they're not your bees. So yep. blame blame yeah. somebody else yeah. if they're not branded yeah. uh, <laughs> You got from your rapier. attorney hat on there, Brian. <laughs> yeah, let me ask you, because there's been some questions as to whether or not bees are more attracted to salt water versus, you know, just a regular flowing water mm -hmm. or chlorine, whatever it may be. So if you had maybe a salt water setup, would that be more attractive? Do you know to the bees, would they likely go to that versus? Nikki, or is there what I've found is, is bees go in both directions. We have a salt water pool. And we find them very docile mm -hmm. because we're not out swatting at them. Right. If you start swatting at mm -hmm. bees, they're going to put a pheromone on you, and then they're going to start buzzing you. Um, but bees love chlorine, mm -hmm. and bees love salt. And so that salt water or chlorine water is going to be an attractant. And I'm going to do a test this year of having my bees uh, over 1,000 feet away. Mm -hmm. and see if they're still attracted to the pool. Um, we, we found that they ignored our pool. We had it put in in May or in April, mm -hmm. and we didn't see any coming to the pool until late July. And then they were there for mm -hmm. the rest of the time. And, and basically what they look for is a seam where they can go down into the water 
and then they do their drink and they go back up. It's like a ladder mm-hmm. almost, and then they fly off. And when one falls in, I just put my finger out there, let them climb on it, and I just blow on them to get that little Mm -hmm. bit of water off of them, and then they fly off. It's funny that you mentioned that. I wonder if it's because the temperatures were so hot at the end of the year because our Mm. pool was very similar. We didn't see any, and then it was like they just started coming towards the end of summer, and Mm -hmm. um, my daughter would have her little friends over, and she would Mm -hmm. be okay. She'd be like, look, Mom, the bees are here, but the friends, not so much. They didn't love it so much, Mm -hmm. So, but we did notice more towards the end of the summer. Yeah, so So we'll see if I I got something that we can – utilize in in science here or, or yeah. not um Be interesting on that there. to see how that so, turns out yeah so yeah we will we will see <laughs> and we'll see how happy everybody is the bees and me at the end of the season <laughs> on that there okay so we've talked about the water source and now let's talk about the drainage part um we we talked uh that we got to have great footing now some of us um have carts that we've we've got to bring over to put our honey supers or to bring empty supers in and the last thing that you want to do is have your tires get stuck in the mud so you got to have good drainage um for, for that there all right now that i've wet my whistle a little bit more we can continue here so we want to have this as semi-level ground. Uh, we don't want to have this on an embankment. Uh, it just makes it a little bit tougher on you as, as as a beekeeper and also just to keep good drainage there. So uh, being on top of a hill is great, but getting there is, is also important. Brian, do you have any questions uh, from your side? Uh, I've just uh, seen a question or two uh, okay. wondering when uh, the start of bee season kicks off for Mountain Sweet Honey. I know you mentioned a date earlier, but uh, is that what, the second uh, Friday in March? Is that uh, accurate? Yes, it, it's the 8th and 9th is when we're we're getting our, our nukes in, and we've got uh, 500 coming in. And, oh, fantastic. And we're going to have a lot of new beekeepers and one of the fun things on this and what we're going to do some videos folks of of our nuke day and um we'll, we'll show some of those interviews that we we've had there but um this is once again folks uh th- why we're doing a special edition is to just go through why we do what we do as beekeepers now you can get one two or three of these wrong uh, because of where your setting is but you'll have to make it up in one way or another to help keep your bees on the offensive rather than the defense um, on that there. Because playing the defensive role in beekeeping is a lose-lose situation on that there. All right, Nikki, do you have any final questions? Um, yeah, just one more question. So um, in an area where you have to do a rooftop hive, would this setup yes. look similar or would that change when you're on a rooftop? Well, that's a very good question because we have a lot of beekeepers in New York City mm-hmm. and uh, they're going to have very level ground. And let me um, digress here just a little bit. One thing that we want on our hives is to have them at a one degree to two degree slant forward. If we're standing here behind the hive, um, we want that to slant forward so that the water, when it comes down, it will hit there and then go off. If we have it going the other way, the water will come in and flood the hive. So when we have a hive stand, we wanna have that uh, leaning one degree downward on that there. Now, let's get back to, to urban beekeeping. Um, urban beekeeping is a lot different. Um, we have folks that have apartments and homes uh, in metropolitan areas, and they face west. Mm-hmm. That's okay. You can still put them out on your patio, or maybe there's a, a, a garden area at the top of, of one of the skyscrapers in New York City, and they're facing the wrong way. Go on ahead, put the bees out there. They're just not going to be as productive as a farmer that puts these out in in the middle of his field 
and in a southeasterly uh, fashion. Okay. They will get honey. They will get uh, plenty of honey, but they won't have the production that a farmer that has them right out in the middle of a field sure. with 100% sunlight. Okay. That makes right? sense. Yeah. The, the, the other things are is um, when it comes to urban beekeeping, you don't have to see the flora. Um, uh, to, to get into it, um, there's, there's roughly, Nikki, 5,000 beekeepers in New York City. Wow. And, uh, and it's fun to, as we get orders in and I see New York City mm -hmm. um, a, as the locale or Manhattan or the Bronx, that um, we've been there. Yeah. And, and we have other beekeepers in that area and they're making it happen and they're producing honey. And they sometimes wonder where in the world is that nectar coming from because they might see a tree at the distance, but it's all a concrete jungle. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the bees will find it. They're really good at that. And, and yes, they'll fly up 45 stories high if they need to. <laughs> yeah. And so um, it, they don't have to be on the ground. And, in fact, I'm really amazed, Nikki, on how many urban beekeepers we have mm -hmm. um, as customers. Yeah. So I've seen quite a few that have come in from Manhattan myself. And uh -huh. um, having been to Manhattan for the first time last year, um, I, as you said, it's a concrete jungle. You can't mm -hmm. see. At first I was in awe and then I was like, I don't know if I could live this way because it's building after building. Yeah. But it's it's an amazing place to go and visit. But my thought too was, where are they going to get the nectar? Where are they going to find their pollen? What are they mm -hmm. doing? But they're obviously doing it because like you said, we have Customers, I see orders all the time. People, well, right these. on top of Times Square, we mm -hmm. have some hives that are up there with some yeah. of our customers, wow. and uh, so they're they're in the most fashionable, <laughs> known area in the world. Yeah. All right. Well, folks, that is what we have for our special edition Buzz TV for you today.